This is unmistakable. The fact that Victoria 3, in one year since release, has gone from offering wars that look like this, anonymous and static, to looking like this, now offering incredibly detailed and vast representation of battlefields and frontlines, is nothing short of a massive W for Paradox and a vindication of what the fans have been screaming for since release. In my launch review of Victoria 3, I praised it for its addictive gameplay, beautiful visuals, great music, and for offering a vast world with an incredible breadth of nations to choose from. I lamented the prevalence of bugs and a cumbersome UI at times, a certain lack of flavor, and the highly confusing warfare system, even though I could see that a frontline based system could be fun, even though despite that it back then definitely wasn't up to par. Now, one year later, with the release of Victoria 3 version 1.5, the game has never been in a better shape, and has in fact become exactly what the game should have been on launch. And so, let's jump into this updated review of Victoria 3 and dive into everything that's going on here. This is a review for both newcomers and veterans out there. So get comfy, and let's jump into this behemoth of a strategy game. When asked what Victoria 3 really is, I find it hard to compare it to other Paradox games, but I think that's the beauty of it. In some ways, it marries Europa Universalis 4 with Hearts of Iron 4, and arguably even with a dash of Imperator Rome, while at the same time very much being its own thing. You'll perhaps notice that I didn't really mention Victoria 2 here, which can seem strange, but Victoria 2 is a game from a completely different era. A game from vastly different design languages and philosophies, and for better or worse, a very different game from Victoria 3. Now, I liked Victoria 2, but found it underwhelming in comparison to Paradox's immediate and much later games, and so this is no inherent negative factor for me. But despite these comparisons, Victoria 3 is very much its own game, and a year after release has come into its own and solidified itself as a strong title fully capable of standing on its own legs and perhaps in contrast to a few other titles in the genre these days, completely without the need for DLC if you want to dive in wrong. Victoria 3 mostly takes place in the long 19th century, meaning it officially spans the years 1836 to 1936. This means that we find ourselves in a post-Napoleonic wars world, where Great Britain is the world's strongest empire, not least of all by dominating markets around the world. But don't let that little number one sign fool you, because having the most prestige at the start does not guarantee you lasting glory. The 19th century is one of great powers and a rule of great powers after all, a century of major changes in the strength of some empires and the rise of others. In Europe, France remains powerful and still clings to the idea of Napoleon's legacy. <laughs> Prussia, once a lesser German state, eyes not hegemony just in Germany, but a fully operational German Empire. In Asia, the Ottoman Empire is in stark decline and must go up against even the elements to reassert itself, while the Chinese also have their fair share of troubles due to, let's just say they really do be handling a little too much of the good stuff. And in America, where the United States stand at the precipice of civil war, but is virtually destined to assert itself as one of the world's great powers, if not the greatest of them all. Despite everything I've just said, you can control each and every state in the game, as long as they are recognized as such. And thusly, you, to the best of your ability, may change the course of the future of any of the countries herein. This is the beauty of Victoria 3 and Paradox games in general, the sheer freedom of what's possible and open to you. Of course, not every nation is made equal in Victoria 3, as some countries, namely mostly the great powers, offer the most value at the moment. And by value, I mean unique content that makes them stand out further. This brings us to the Journal, a mission system of sorts which in Victoria 3 acts as an optional guiding tool for your campaign. The Journal offers every faction in this game various generic missions, most often related to the development of your state, in order to bring you forward and give you set goals, that more often than not will be beneficial to you. For example, urbanizing your country or building railroads brings you along the path to industrialization, which is what the 19th century was all about. But for the truly fun journal entries, we must look to a set section of factions in particular, namely the Greats for the most part. Austria, a multifaceted empire in the Victorian age, must deal with several issues right off the bat. As South Germans and Habsburgs, Plo. the Austrians still see themselves as leading the Holy Roman Empire and dreams of becoming the true recognized German hegemon. As such, they must fight with Prussia, either militarily or diplomatically, to complete their journal entries to at one point hope to unify the German people. 
But at home, Austria is a multicultural but discriminatory empire and must decide whether to recognize the Hungarians as true citizens, thus paving the way for the formation of an Austria-Hungary. The Prussians have similar missions, although more focused on Germany itself, as Prussia is able to initially form not just the North German Federation, but Germany itself. The Ottoman Empire similarly has a range of journal entries to fulfill, most of them related to the saving of the empire in its various aspects, from rebuilding the industry to the army, reforming the political landscape of the empire to be more modernized, and to make sure the Egyptians are put in their place. On the other side of the world, the United States has entries dealing with the law of slavery and whether to keep it or ban it, which ultimately is very likely to lead to civil war. Unless you manage to maneuver the landscape tightly, of course. Other states around the world share similar missions and journal entries, and I think this type of flavor adds so much to the experience. Personally, I really wish Victoria's system looked and felt more like EU4's, where we have visible mission branches all laid out with unique and beautifully drawn icons. Compared to these, I find Victoria 3's journal system lacking in visual style and finesse, but it's not a deal breaker. If you additionally own the DLCs, Voice of the People and Colossus of the South, both and unique missions and deepens the experience for both France and Brazil, plus South American factions respectively. This means that France receives unique entries related to the emergence of the French Empire and the power struggle enabling Napoleon III, and Brazil gets to fight over the destiny of that country of whether it should remain an empire or become a republic, and much like the US, determine the role of slavery in the country. Paradox games are not built in a day, nor in a year, but I think in terms of historical flavor like this, when compared to fan favorites like CK2, CK3, that Victoria 3 actually offers a surprising amount of unique campaigns here, solely based on these journal entries and the way they charter and affect your playstyle. But journal entries are not the only way Victoria 3 brings unique flavor to its countries, as both culture and even more factors play important roles here. For example, I find it extremely cool that a minor power like Norway, who even begins this game in a personal union with Sweden, and unless the player takes charge would likely never amount to much, is in fact offered a surprising amount of succulent taste. For example, the starting Norwegian army is named Haren, meaning army in Norwegian, and is indeed how Norwegians refer to the state army. It's awesome that like every state in this game, Norway's political scene is not just a blank slate, but it actually begins in a state that's more or less exactly aligned with how the country's internal laws looked at game start. More than that, the parties within Norway, rather than always being called something generic, are actually given the Norwegian names, and when new parties show up, they're also given their real life names, meaning it's cool to see new parties, like the Labour Party, show up and emerge as time goes on and as the agitation of the workers becomes stronger. Further, every country is given generic local agitators that wish to change the political landscape of your state, but that with the Voice of the People DLC, countries are also given actual historical agitators. And Norway in this example is no different. And you might hear it in my voice, but it's so much fun to see people you've learned about in school and who are often considered national legends actually show up in Victoria 3 as important characters. And lastly, unique buildings will be present depending on where you're located. And as in the case of Norway, since resources are rather correctly placed around the world, you're going to be seeing a lot of iron, a lot of logging camps for producing wood, a lot of ports for fish, and importantly, whaling is an important and semi-rare building available in northern Norway, meaning that even in the realm of buildings, you will find uniquely flavored distinctions as well. Norway doesn't really have any unique journal entries on its own, which certainly is a shame. I mean, it took Paradox 8 years to give Norway and the Nordic countries their very own unique missions and revamps in Hearts of Iron 4. But still, even without journal entries, there is so much to love and so many unique sides to this Norwegian experience. And I believe the same goes for virtually every other major or minor power out there to admittedly varying degrees. This is all to say that even though not all states are created equal, the baseline of being offered unique cultures, distinct and mostly historical political situations at the beginning of your campaign, historically and geographically accurate resources that shape countries, and often uniquely and language appropriate named parties and characters go a very long way in creating a culturally deep and rich experience. Is the game exactly where I'd want it to be? No, not yet, I guess. But guess what? EU4 was a great strategy game on launch. I certainly loved it back in August 2013, but it offered just a fraction of what it ended up offering a few years later. 
In fact, it took a long 5 years of that game being out and worked on before we got the first iteration of the unique mission tree and a proper parliament system, i.e. proper new ways of governing. And it took a long 8 years before Central Europe got a true revamp of the Holy Roman Empire system, which is such an integral part of so many important factions in that game. And mark my words, this is not to say that this should have been in the game on launch, because there's no way they could have been. Learning, improving, and developing takes time and money after all. But rather, the fact that Victoria 3 has so many of the basics covered already, and for way more factions, and without the need to purchase any DLC for it, is frankly awesome. Victoria 3 is so much more than just a state you rule of course, and the main deciding factor in how the game progresses is not really who you rule, but how you rule. So let's begin with the most exciting part of Victoria 3, since it's the one that's received one of the largest revamps in the series history, Warfare. Back at launch, Warfare in Victoria 3 was bare bones. The stated idea from Paradox was that less focus was put on warfare and micromanaging in particular because the main aim of Victoria 3 was internal politics, population management and trade. Now these last three things are all well and good, but in my opinion, there is no grand strategy game and certainly no Paradox grand strategy game without borders moving and shifting and doing so primarily duking it out on the battlefield. That's not to say Paradox games have never been warfare managed in the first, unless we're talking Hearts of Iron 4, but it's always been important. Warfare in EU4, for example, is integral to that game even though technological advancement, state management are crucial parts of that game as well. But the problem with Victoria 3 on launch wasn't just that control was taken more away from us, but also that it just didn't work well. And further, that these systems behind and results following from battles appeared nonsensical. And to top it all off, they didn't even look good, but appeared boring, static, and very hastily put together. Now though, with version 1.5, warfare is vastly improved, and not least of all in that last department. Now, Victoria 3 sports arguably the best warfare animations in any Paradox game ever, and I will say that I think they look even more dynamic and epic than the ones in Hearts of Iron 4. Now, front lines are filled with soldiers, artillery, defensive barricades and positions, and even the beautiful flags of the participating nations. These positions will even adapt to the environment, meaning while the long and flat fronts of Western Europe might be easy enough to render, the mountains of Norway will see certain positions holding the high ground. It doesn't work perfectly though, and sometimes you'll see armies literally fighting in the ocean. Now this could have been a really cool feature, say if an enemy invaded from the sea but had to make a beach landing and do a D-Day situation, but this was not the case here. Either way, I truly find these new animations to be groundbreaking, and even though in the end it remains people shooting at each other until one side wins, so like in EU4 or Hearts of Iron, the spectacle, in addition to some extra victory and defeat animations, does indeed turn this into something of a paradigm shift for Paradox battle animations. I didn't mention Stellaris here because I find it to be quite a different experience, but that game does admittedly offer very cool animations as well. One area where even more visual improvements could have been made is in the naval department though, where yes, one more ship is present on each side, but they don't shoot very often, and we are clearly still lacking finesse and that spice here. More smoke, more natural shooting instead of one rare burst, and so on. I'd love to see better naval animations in later updates, but for now, it's at least better than what we had. Now, army management is a different beast, and even though it retains the soul of the release version, i.e. the management of armies and assigning them to front lines, I find that the way it goes about this has dramatically improved. First of all, the revamp of the UI now does a much better job of giving you a good overview over your armies, generals, and the aspects they're in. Your armies are neatly vertically lined up, Generals or their empty seats are front and center, and all vital information is right here, like where the unit is currently stationed, which orders your commanding generals are given, where they are mobilized, and so on. What is important to notice though, and what will be confusing to you if you don't know where to look, is the importance of number of battalions in an army versus its actual fighting strength. For example, an army with a fighting strength of 73 men is for the most part very strong, but the actual strength of that army comes from the actual men in those regiments left to fight. As you can see, the numbers of regiments after a war begins is almost always higher, sometimes much higher than the actual number of thousands of fighting units, because when a battle occurs, the number of regiments is what's being shown, while the blue bar, signifying lives left, is what in the end actually matters. 
This is why you sometimes can see much larger armies lose to smaller ones. Because while the larger one might have fought all the war, the smaller might be fresh, and of course might even be better trained. This leads us to everything surrounding the numbers. You see, everything in Victoria 3's warfare system relies on each other. In this case, every army is influenced by its general, which can affect their morale and offensive and defensive strength, and even special formations depending on the general, and of course the ratio of infantry to cannons to cavalry, but more than that are the mobilization options. Victoria 3 allows you to outfit your armies with various ways of being, say giving your soldiers chocolate, tobacco, or even opium to deal with the stress of the battlefield. You can even assign armies to make use of your railway systems for faster movement or use your market resources to set up first aid stations or even field hospitals. All of these affect various aspects of your individual army's morale, recovery rate, and offensive and defensive capabilities. And while it's a bit more in the background, they are essential to pay attention to and use correctly. Of course, you need to be aware that assigning these modifiers do drain resources from your market, and can be very expensive if you're short on a resource. Either way, if you find yourself losing battle after battle, it might just be because you're not using your mobilization options correctly. It's a deep and great system that only becomes more fun to use and fiddle with with time, as you unlock more technologies and expand your market to accommodate new options. You can even easily see which modifiers your enemy army is using, meaning it's quite transparent actually, and can tell why you might be having a hard time battling a seemingly superior foe. Of course, a major part of warfare is sound strategic and tactical thinking, and there are more ways than one to topple an enemy empire. Victoria 3's warfare system is based on front lines for armies and sea nodes for navies, and moving them about is as easy as ever. We can station units in friendly territories, deploy them to fronts, plan naval invasions by combining the army with the navy, and transfer units between armies. It's fairly simple to grasp, and the UI does a good job now of making it simple to work with as well. What's even better is that armies and their movements are now visibly represented by each army signifier moving on the map, and with the pathways they'll be taking to their location. It's even possible to see their 3D models move around now as well, which is a massive step up from the non-existent models on launch. One of the biggest improvements to warfare is that every frontline can now experience several battles at once, and each battle will often feature relatively large portions of your armies. In addition, while the abilities of your generals, offensive and defensive capabilities, and other modifiers will matter a whole lot for the outcome of any battle, I find that the number of soldiers now matter a lot more than they used to, meaning that the results of battle will often be more in line with expectations. Not always though, because it does admittedly feel strange and confusing to not know why one army's offensive capability is so much lower than an opposing army's defensive ones, because it's not immediately clear in the UI. But actually, it's largely up to your ratio of infantry to cannons to cavalry. And while infantry gives you much more defensive capabilities, cannons give you much more offensive ones. Since this is so clear in EU4 for example, where we instantly can find out a general's stats, plus if either army has negative or positive modifiers from terrain, I really feel that Victoria 3 needs to adopt a similar, clear approach. Another problem arises when there are several allied nations on the same front, and when other generals than your own begin the fighting. First of all, it's rather hard to find out which armies will make it to those battles, and it can be especially weird if a general from a smaller and weaker nation seems to be fighting all the frontline battles when you, the larger and mightier army, should be the one leading the charge. I've also encountered issues with tiny allied AI armies trying to go on the offensive but getting whacked by the enemy, which can completely halt an offensive process and lower war enthusiasm due to manpower losses. Apparently this is something Paradox is looking into and is about to fix, but that's at least something I've experienced and which is quite frustrating. But what's arguably worse are the next two aspects I find to be severely lacking. For one, in a war, enemy armies, in order to get to an active front line away from their land borders, have at times been able to simply march through the territory of their enemies, completely bypassing their enemy and front lines with seemingly no consequences. I will admit I've seen it less recently, so whether it's been completely fixed I can't really say, but when it's happening it's been confusing and frustrating, and I feel like for front lines and borders to be truly valuable, enemy armies can't be able to march through them on their way to another front. If they can't find a way, they just can't find a way. It really should be that simple. It's just kinda dumb when things like this happen, so if it's not being addressed already, it really needs to. But like I said, I've experienced this way less recently. Another important theater of war are the naval battles and the accompanying naval invasions. And while it is great and crucial, might I add, that Victoria 3 indeed does feature naval battles and gameplay, as opposed to say Crusader Kings 3 dammit, they're not exactly optimal. 
Much like armies, navies can be stationed in naval nodes, meaning important centers of the ocean where navies travel through and from where naval invasions are launched. Interestingly though, a naval battle will not commence even when two enemy fleets are stationed in the same node, as long as they're just moving about. If they stay in the same node, however, or if a naval invasion is attempted and two fleets meet in that node, a battle will then commence. From there, they pretty much follow the same structure as field battles, where parts of yours and the enemy navy duke it out in consecutive battles. As far as this battle design goes, it works well enough, but issues have arisen when a naval invasion is involved. Sometimes it'll take forever, with no real reason specified for the wait. Other times they've just bugged out and never commenced. And a few times, although this is a rare bug for me, a naval invasion has failed, but neither the army nor the navy have been returned under my control. This is horrible admittedly, but something I know Paradox is working on fixing. It's also a bummer that as of writing this review at least, that once an army has been assigned to a naval invasion, its orders can't be changed until it's either succeeded or failed in its mission. And this absolutely needs to be addressed. You're dead. You crazy son of a bitch. You're dead. Lastly, the AI seems to be having major issues with properly utilizing its navy. For example, an easy way to defeat Great Britain has in fact been to sneak an army onto the home islands through a naval invasion, which honestly should be extremely difficult when considering that the wooden wall is an English classic. Even though it can help you win the war, it definitely harms the immersion, I'd say, and does feel a bit like cheating, even though you're just making use of the game's mechanics. When it comes to actually winning wars, Victoria 3 does some exceptionally awesome things, but also makes a few bad choices. Getting to the good parts first, I truly find it revolutionary that it's possible for both sides of a conflict to give concessions and experience victories. In an extremely exciting Ottoman Egyptian war, where I as France graciously decided to help Egypt on the conditions that if we both won the war, I would become the new overlord over the Ottoman subject of Tripolitania. And what happened was that all sides got bogged down in Egypt. Despite gains in Anatolia and now ending up with the initiative, the Egyptians had lost so many men that they were tired of war. And then, an agreement was made that would benefit all parties in some way. While the Ottomans would get their initial war claim of Konya, the Egyptians would get a treaty port returned to them, and I would indeed get Tripolitania as my subject. In other words, somehow, Victoria 3 has now by far the best system for peace negotiations, offering not just a zero-sum or white peace option, but an actual possibility of mutually beneficial peace agreements. It might not sound like all that if you're new to the series, but to someone like me, who's used to the one-sided victories of other Paradox games, and frankly, any strategy game, this new system appears revolutionary. As alluded to, Victoria 3 allows other nations, no matter whether they're your allies or not, to join an ongoing diplomatic play in its second phase, i.e. the diplomatic lead up to war. And now, not only can the war initiator tempt potential partners with a wide variety of war spoils should they win, but every involved nation can offer to join either side of the war in return for the same spoils. Not only is this awesome, since it actually gives so much more room for opportunism, but the AI is really good at making the most of it, both as war leaders and as potential allies in your own wars. I'm really enjoying these systems and find that they bring so much more depth to diplomacy in the crucial aspect of war. At the same time, not everything is perfect. As it stands right now, a country's war enthusiasm is essentially what determines their willingness to capitulate or agree to unfavorable terms. As you lose soldiers in the field, the enthusiasm will naturally take down in a steady pace and will accelerate if land is lost. It makes sense in theory, but as of right now, it doesn't work that well in practice. For one, war enthusiasm, at least for the defending nations in a war, will not go below zero if no land or war goal has been lost. Thing is, if war enthusiasm reached minus 100, either nation will capitulate immediately and accept any war goal thrust upon them. This is how I managed to finesse great concessions from, again, Great Britain. In my war with Belgium, the Brits and the Belgians managed to hold the line effectively in the Low Countries, and I got nowhere, and neither did their war enthusiasm. But by sending a small force to occupy British colonies, Britain slowly lost its enthusiasm because now land was occupied. And so, because of some relatively insignificant losses, the Brits capitulated and were hit with some massive penalties. Not only did this allow me to fight the Belgians on their own, but it again very much felt like exploiting the AI when all I did was a clever thing to do. I definitely think taking colonies should matter for their war score, but it shouldn't mean so much to the Brits that they just give up their war against an expansionist friend. And the same goes for losses in war, I feel. 
Right now, it kind of feels like losses means way too much too quickly in determining when a country capitulates, and can lead to some extremely weird victories or losses. In other words, while the overall concept and now execution of Victoria 3's warfare are leagues better than they were a year ago, and I actually love it now and I'm genuinely excited for my next war, I actually dare say they can now feel even better than wars in other Paradox games, they still need to iron out some very strange bugs and design choices, and to implement clear information on why things are turning out the way they are. And the reason for this is that because Paradox has turned Victoria 3's warfare system into tangible systems, rather than the relatively sandboxy warfare of EU4 and CK2, or even Victoria 2. We actually need these systems to work properly, and while I'm sure that's actually a lot harder to figure out with these new mechanics, there are some major fixable things, as mentioned in this video, that will go a long way to make it that much more better and predictable. Of course, leading up to war is always diplomacy, and in Victoria 3, we do diplomacy in a completely new way, for better or worse. Some diplomatic actions might be as straightforward as ever, like for example the improved relations feature or unilateral decisions like deciding to bankroll a country. We can, without a lot of fuss, also attempt to trade states with a foreign nation now, which is an amazing feature to have, right from the diplomacy tab. In this way, certain parts of diplomacy is as easy as they are in games like EU4. But if you want to go a bit deeper, most actions, especially those dealing with influence or potential military conflict between states, can be found in a diplomatic lens. This is where you come across every possible diplomatic action in Victoria 3, and there are a lot of them. From asking people to join your customs union, to forming alliances and taking on debt, these are regular diplomatic interactions where one side has to agree to a deal, even though we may here use obligations, which can help in getting the other party to agree. But if we want to do something more, let's say puppeting a foreign nation or demand territory, well, unless your target backs down immediately, which they rarely do by the way, we begin what's known as a diplomatic play. Diplomatic plays is a centerpiece of Victoria 3, because this is where shit goes down. Before a war has started, both parties go through a diplomatic play of three phases, deciding on claims, grabbing partners to your side, and then mobilizing your troops. The first and the latter can be done at any point, but only during this middle phase can other factions opt in to join in the war on either side. As one of Victoria 3's cornerstones, a lot is riding on this system, and it definitely is cool in many ways. It's genuinely great that we can draw and be drawn into wars by other factions, and what's more is that wars do not have to happen either. In fact, depending on the strength of the opposing alliance, both you and your opponent may at any point choose to back down and let either nation win their primary war goal before even a shot is fired. The existence of a primary war goal necessitates the existence of secondary war goals, naturally. And the war goals are an important part of any diplomatic play, not just because it determines what can be gained, but because in Victoria 3, you actually don't gain infamy by taking your war goals after a won war, but simply by the act of demanding them. It's how you can end up biting over more than you can chew even before a war has begun. You see, in Victoria 3, infamy determines how much of a menace you are, how willing you are to expand your nation's borders and trample over other states. If your infamy level rises high enough, other nations will like you less, are more likely to band together against you, and can even attack you with a special war goal called Cut Down to Size, which means that if completed, the defending nation will have to release all subjects and provinces gained through conquest in the past 10 years. This can be devastating, especially since, if you're already at a stage where one great power targets you with Cut Down to Size, other great powers are very likely to join in, which is definitely not a nice feeling, at all, and can totally sabotage a campaign unless you have the army and navy to back up your expansionist ways. Diplomatic plays, then, is overall a very cool way of structuring wars and demands, especially in an era that's more and more interconnected, and more and more dominated by great powers. But it's not perfect. For example, it can be frustrating when you're playing as a minor power like Norway, and trying to make a diplomatic move like, say, conquer Denmark. When I targeted the Danish capital with a conquer claim, the freaking USA came to Danish aid, siding with them in the war, despite not having an alliance or defensive pact. This obviously made it impossible for me to do anything, and I found it quite unrealistic that the US, probably quite unwilling in the middle of the 19th century to fight in a minor overseas European war, would join in here. I retried, of course, now targeting Iceland instead of the Danish capital region. 
and lo and behold, the US didn't care this time, probably since those regions were less important in infamy levels. In other words, it is sometimes possible to circumvent the ire of the great powers, but still, this sort of intervention happens quite a lot I'd say, much more than is actually fun, and if I think Paradox could do something to make Victoria 3 a bit more flexible and maneuverable, it would be to raise the threshold for when great powers actually decide to join diplomatic plays like this, especially when there were no immediate massive benefits for them doing so. I do think it's an interesting choice, however, to allow anyone with a strategic interest in a region to potentially join a conflict in said region. I just think that threshold for when the AI decides to join needs to be tweaked, since after all, putting dozens if not hundreds of thousands of men on the line and possibly your own strategic defense is a big risk. So far, I haven't really touched on Victoria 3's lens system, which is for all intents and purposes the main shortcut to most of the game's actions. Here you can not only choose between diplomatic actions, but also pick buildings to construct, trade items to import or export, or decrease to proclaim, and this leads us to Victoria 3's arguably most important aspect, the economy and the market. You see, despite wars and diplomacy being important, every country in Victoria 3 is dependent on every building, every resource, and every citizen, meaning it's a multifaceted system that is ever-changing and evolving. Every building has a specific purpose, and do not just create one or more resources depending on which sector it belongs to, but create jobs and wealth for your pops, and tax revenue for the state. Virtually every building demands input resources to create new goods, and manufacture their own, sometimes goods that are end products themselves, but mostly resources that are used in other factories. What's most important here is that the success of each building depends on the price of goods coming in, and the price of goods going out, which in the end determines the surplus and profitability of the building sector. While it is possible to subsidize sectors depending on your economic laws, it should always be a primary goal to have most buildings be profitable, which in turn allows them to pay good taxes and hire new workers, which again raises the standard of living in your empire. With the 1.5 update, prices per goods are now determined both on a local level and on a market level, meaning goods will be cheaper for a factory if said good is also manufactured in that country's province. This means you're encouraged to concentrate your industry in resource-heavy provinces, especially if several similar input goods circulate in the local factories. But it doesn't end there. Each building has different production methods, meaning there are even more ways of managing them. Production methods govern how resources are made, from which material, how they're brought to market, and who owns the factories. Meaning a lot is at play here. Frankly, it's an amazing system, especially when you consider how you can determine production methods per region. All of this is further deepened by your technology, which influences the availability of your methods and your laws, which determine things like who can take control of the factories, which sectors can be subsidized, and how free your market is, i.e. how much of your construction sector is allocated to the private sector, and how much command you have over the economy, and goods coming in and out. This brings us to the market, which is where all your resources circulate and become available. Every country is part of a market, but some countries are market leaders, and some are market members. This can happen in several ways. A country can be a part of a larger nation's customs union, or they can be any type of subject to the overlord, also incorporating them into their market. Everything built within a market circulates there, and determines the pricing of goods within that market. Goods can then be imported or exported from and to that market, thus interacting with other markets. It is admittedly a big system that might take you some time to learn, but which is very satisfying once you get the hang of it. Complementing it are things like trade agreements, which do not put you in the same market, but which makes it essentially free to trade with your partner and allows you to do so without making use of valuable bureaucracy points. This is where we come to Victoria 3's mana points, or important government resources so to speak. Bureaucracy, authority, and influence points all govern various parts of your state, and your ability to make effective changes within these domains. For example, bureaucracy, coming primarily from administration centers in your state, allows you to tax your population, establish trade routes, and maintain important government institutions. Authority allows you to enact laws faster, while also order decrees to make various aspects of regions better. Finally, influence lets you actually make diplomatic agreements, and it also raises the rate at which infamy decreases. It should be mentioned that none of these have true hard caps. It's all a soft cap for when a mechanic turns positive or negative, which really begins above and below the number zero. I tend to enjoy the use of point systems like these in Paradox games, particularly because I feel like they work organically alongside the ways to make those numbers go up and down. 
It feels natural that building administration centers, for example, increases your power to tax the population and maintain trade relations with other nations, i.e. keep the bureaucracy running. This leads us to the government side of things, because every nation is made up of a head of state, a government with interest groups, and laws and institutions. The interest groups in your country and your starting laws will vary from nation to nation and are based on the historical position of each country. Interest groups can be harder or easier to change or maintain depending, as is the case in the Ottoman Empire, where the old aristocracy is majorly powerful and keeps you from evolving, which also makes it harder to enact laws you need to make reforms. I think it's a great system, honestly, since it constantly keeps you thinking about how restricted nations can be because of their internal political makeup, while overcoming major obstacles feel like massive wins in their own right. This also ties into the population system, of course, which frankly influences every aspect of the game. Pops belong to interest groups, which again have a say in how powerful they are, and Pops also work in industries and buy and need goods, meaning the prices in your market do not only determine what they can afford, but the overall standard of living, and therefore, which interest groups they see themselves belonging to. As such, Pops can move between interest groups as they become richer or poorer, and laws in your country will in turn also affect their literacy level, meaning which jobs they are able to take. These are vastly complicated systems, but relatively easy to approach since it really doesn't demand that you know too much about it from the get-go, at least if you're not going to be making pro-gamer moves. Do be wary though, because factories need workers to produce anything, and if your country is tiny in a small market, you might find yourself without manpower or big enough workforce to expand. As you can probably tell by now, Victoria 3 is an absolute behemoth of a game. There are so many systems here, so many facets, so many features that make up this beautifully expansive game that it's hard to put it all together in a coherent review, but I've absolutely tried my best. Jumping back after update 1.5 has been for the vast majority of my time an absolute blast and has only affirmed my trust in Paradox that they're able to fix what does not work in the beginning and make better what was already there. That does not mean there are no blemishes. The warfare system at times act buggy, can be hard to fully understand. The game does a relatively poor job of telling you the most optimized organization of your army, meaning the ratio of infantry to artillery and cavalry, and could definitely use more information available at a glance. Sometimes the UI kinda bugs out, and I wish, wish, wish so badly for a diplomatic UI, a screen that easily showed you which country's Nation X was at war with, without having to jump into the diplomatic play tab. I hope for a better, more natural or historical feeling great power participation in diplomatic place, kinda like in Hearts of Iron 4 I guess, so that smaller nations can at least get some room to maneuver. And finally, it would be really great to have even more flavor for the great and major powers. While we do have the journal entry, I really wish for a system that looks and feels more like the mission tree system in EU4, because it just appears so artistic, and not like the mostly bland, text-based entries in Victoria 3. I also have to say that I currently find the level of internal revolt and revolutions to be a bit much. Historically, revolutions were rare, although certain countries at times experienced quite many uprisings, like during the springtime of peoples. But that doesn't mean an entire country should be split down the middle due to the odd aristocratic or religious revolt every five years, which seem way too powerful at the moment. The same goes for political parties, sometimes demanding you change a law into something they shouldn't want to happen really, and then losing an immense amount of loyalty because you fail to do something that sometimes seems to go against their own interests. Like with the military party wanting to do away with professional armies and implementing a national militia. And finally, I really lament the lack of a diplomatic puppet option a la EU4, because right now, there is no way to diplomatically and friendly puppet a country that you have high relations with, and who's also in your customs union, for example, unless you're lucky. You can only puppet nations through war, really, or if they back it down before a diplomatic play begins, or through highly unlikely and obscure personal unions, and this needs to change. That being said, if you've ever thought about jumping back into Vicky 3 or trying it for the first time, there has literally never been a better time than right now. In fact, Victoria 3 might just be one of my favorite Paradox games simply because it really doesn't demand that you own any DLCs for it to feel great, or like the definitive version you need to play if you're going to play at all. Sure, if you want to play as France, I definitely recommend having the Voice of the People DLC, and the same goes for Brazil and Colossus of the South. Simply because they add a lot of narrative flavor, I wouldn't want to be without. But those are quite specific, and frankly they're not that expensive either, especially if you get them on sale. We also shouldn't leave this review without a comment on the music, which is mostly just fantastic and really captures the era. 
I will say that what the music of Victoria 3 sorely lacks though, is proper blood pumping battle music, which it completely and utterly lacks. This baffles me, especially since the war music of CK2, EU4, Hearts of Iron 4, and Imperator Rome are all incredible, Oscar tier battle soundtracks, and I need more of this in Victoria 3. More or less exactly one year and one month since Victoria 3's release, I have to say that I'm really happy with the way this game is evolving, and the changes made. The fact that Paradox actually saw the light and changed up the war mechanics and their animations in particular is an immense improvement, and I can't wait to see what we'll get with the Sphere of Influence DLC, which hopefully makes diplomacy even better and more interesting. I truly recommend checking out Victoria 3 if you're interested in this time period or in another deep and grand strategy experience, and can't wait to see what's in store. That doesn't even cover the modding scene of course, which keeps expanding and offering more and more, and I have indeed been using visual mods in this video to alter the look of the map, the link to which you can find in the description. Let me know your thoughts on Victoria 3 and this review in the comments, and make sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a like on the video. It really goes a long way. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.